Kong is one of Asia's richest cities, but it also has the region's largest wealth disparity, with some 18% of the population living below the poverty line. The government hopes to narrow the territory's income gap with a mandatory minimum wage for workers next year. But critics say this won't solve the poverty issue and may have a disastrous effect on the world's freest economy. I'm Fauzia Ibrahim. On this edition of 101 East, we ask, can Hong Kong's minimum wage bridge the wealth divide? Hong Kong is known as a vibrant city on the move. This once fishing village has evolved into an international financial center, boasting one of the highest GDPs in the world and claiming to be home to the most number of billionaires in Asia. Visitors are often dazzled by Hong Kong's image of wealth, glamour and sophistication. But beneath the sheen lies a festering problem. My name is Yao Xi Yan. I am 73 years old. My wife and I live in Hong Kong, while my daughter lives in China. I've worked as a cleaner for over 10 years. My salary is about $700 a month, but I need to earn more. So I work on my days off as well. So I take home around $780 a month. Mr. Yao says his salary, combined with his wife's, barely covers paying for rent, utilities and food. Activists have long called for the implementation of a minimum wage to protect blue-collar workers from exploitation. If we have minimum wage, our employers would have to guarantee us a certain level of pay. They can no longer control the salary range and they will not have an excuse to oppress the workers anymore. Life will be so much better for us low-income earners. And in July this year, the government finally passed legislation for a mandatory minimum wage. Many say the move was to avoid potential social unrest over the territory's growing income gap. Frustration is also building against increasing property prices, which have surged 47% since the start of 2009. A Forbes report ranks Hong Kong as Asia's third most expensive city after Tokyo and Osaka. Limited new supply of housing, low interest rates and increasing numbers of buyers from mainland China are all helping to push values to record highs, both in the high and low end properties. We visited one new development that has attracted many newly rich mainlanders. This is one of Hong Kong's much sought after luxury apartment. Monthly rental here is about 10,000 US dollars, which works out to about $5 per square foot for a four bedroom, two bathroom luxury apartment with a view. And for the same $5 per square foot, many of Hong Kong's poor live in cramped conditions like these. It's not unusual for whole families to share one small apartment with one bathroom and one kitchen. And the view, well, there is no view. Social worker Si Lai Shan often visits families who live in what's popularly called cubicles, small two-bedroom apartments that have been subdivided into cubicles for rent. Lai Shan says there is a steady rise in the number of cubicle residents, a reflection of Hong Kong's growing social problems. There is more and more poverty now. This year, the official number of people who are living below the poverty line is 1.26 million, compared to 1.23 million last year. People who are on low income are earning lower wages, so the wealth divide is getting wider and wider. Because we don't have democracy, only the elite and the rich get to influence the policy makers. 
the poor don't have a political voice. Also, a lot of people have the view that this is not the government's problem, but an individual's issue. Hong Kong people are not aware that poverty is a structural and policy-related problem. While the government hopes a minimum wage will help to lift the standard of living for the poor, many industry leaders fear the legislation could cripple their business. Thomas Wu has been in the restaurant trade for nearly 50 years and owns several dim sum eateries. He says the minimum wage issue will see many businesses fall. Over the last 10 years, Hong Kong's economy has not been good. The food and beverage industry has become a lot more competitive as people are not eating out as much. Despite cutting costs, many restaurants are still not making any profit because rent has gone up and so has the cost of ingredients. And now we have to pay our employees a higher wage. I think a lot of restaurants will shut down. Also, now that the employers will be paying higher salaries, they would want younger, faster workers, so the older staff will be unemployed. But with the legislation already passed, many businesses have resigned themselves to paying their staff a minimum wage. The current debate is how much to set the level. Currently, a blue-collar worker earns an average of $2.50 an hour. The Executive Council has agreed to set the minimum wage at 360. But labor groups say a more realistic and effective number would be closer to 450 an hour. If you consider how much the big businesses get every year, which is something like two and a half billion dollars a year, but their workers get two and a half dollars an hour, it is an unjust situation. And if this situation continues, I believe there will be social unrest in Hong Kong, and the government knows it too. It's a fair warning for this city as it forges ahead as an international symbol of wealth and success. As the number of its underprivileged continue to grow and be left behind, it seems Hong Kong's glitter is not all gold. Coming up after the break, we hear from both sides of the minimum wage debate here in Hong Kong. And we ask if it will indeed bridge Asia's largest income gap. Stay with 101 East. Welcome back to 101 East. This week, we come to you from Hong Kong, one of Asia's wealthiest cities. But with 18% of the population living below the poverty line, we're asking if the implementation of a minimum wage will help bridge one of the region's largest wealth divide. Joining us on the panel now is Simon Wong from the Federation of Restaurants and Related Trades. How are you? Also joining us is Lee Chok Yen from the Confederation of Trade Unions. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us today. Simon, if I could start with you first off. Yes. There's been a lot of objection from the business sector uh, about the implementation of the minimum wage. They say that businesses may fall, unemployment may go up, but a lot of trade unions say that this is just an excuse for businesses not to share their profits. What do you say to that? Well, when you see that the wage would only focus on uh, the four major industries, like the catering industry, the, re re uh, the retail industry, the security industry, and the uh, sanitation industry. Then um, all these uh, industry people who are working uh, in the industry, they did get um, quite, well, not that handsome pay per month. Uh, this but is then, why we need the minimum wage, isn't okay. it? Yeah, so the, we, we, we do the, did have some kind of compromise uh, to agree on uh, introducing minimum wage to those uh, people who are uh, earning below certain level. Uh, but then when you see that um, uh, these four industries, well, we are talking about uh, close to about one million uh, workers in these four industries, uh, they have to bear all the pressure. Um, and then uh, the owners of those uh, companies who are in investing in those industries has to uh, face uh, the, the, the increase in their 
um, uh, you know, the operation. There, operation there are actually costs. two ways of looking at it. You know, they said, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Simon said that it's concentrated on four industry. It's because they are paying very low pay. So it's concentrated on four industry. The thing so is, they we have been exploiting afford. workers for so many years, and now <laughs> it's only time to change. And of course, okay. if you want to complain about costs of this whole industry, yes. we should together, yeah, 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 hand yeah. in hand, complain about the high rent in Hong Kong. It's a high rent that are hurting industry, not workers' pay. And what happens is, is when they are suffering from high rent, the first thing they think about is how to transfer the, the cost to uh, workers so that they suppress uh, the workers' wages. The, not all the owners or the investors are thinking about cutting on uh, you know, the cut, cut, cutting the number of people who work in the industry or cutting their benefits or some, something like that. You know, but we are, I, I've been seeing that we are close in hand, working, employers and workers are close in hand working together. We are on the same boat. We are not fighting with each other. Yeah, so we are that, not in a war. Or, exactly, or that's battle. what I'm trying to see, yeah. say. You know, in the past when there are no minimum wage, you know, the employer tried to shift all the, you know, cost increase to the worker side and, you know, it cost battle <laughs> actually in the past. But at the but same time, the 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 now, let me just stop you there. At the same time, though, a lot of people have said the issue of minimum wage has become a political issue that a lot of politicians have used to exploit in order to get more ground votes. You, as a legislator, would you say that this is the case? Of course, it's a political issue. You know, everything is are a political you using, issue. Are you using this <laughs> issue to try to get no, more ground support? No, of course not. If there, are, they, if there were a minimum wage, when I start to propose it, then it's the government that get all the credit, you know. So well, I, we have been fighting for it for over 12 years, okay. So if they don't want to make it a political issue, why don't the government, you know, uh, uh, proactively well, come why, out with a minimum wage? Why they do you think the resisting. government? Why do you think the government has not come up with a uh, proactively. proactively come up with a minimum you know, wage. We have why is it now that yeah. where there, are, there is fear that there will be social unrest? Well, actually, why do you think trade unions have not been more powerful in terms of this issue? You know, firstly, I think when you ask why they come up with it now, firstly, it's because this government has been resisting actually our call for minimum wage for so many years because they have always sided with the big business. And now, because there's a, you know, really a widening gap and, you know, people can feel the anger among the working people, the social unrest potential, and now they are talking about social harmony. So finally, finally, after years of uh, uh, struggle on the part of the well, union, Jillian, we I, got it now. I uh, somehow I agree to you to a certain extent, but the thing is, Hong Kong's business, 98% uh, of those are SMEs, small and medium companies. And, um, you know, just for the um, uh, catering industry that I'm involved, you know, most of the companies are small restaurants. They are not big companies. Yeah, but big but companies like exactly. Cafe de Coral or like McDonald's. Yeah, or, exactly. But Simon, you have to agree, though, that the yes. government has been on the side of businesses. Uh, Any sort of SME businesses or, or even big businesses. Or <laughs> on the side of businesses, definitely. So businesses yeah. in Hong Kong have had it good for such a long time. They haven't had to deal with minimum wage. But, uh, I ask you yes. now, China and Taiwan both have the minimum wage. Right. Why is Hong Kong lagging behind? Uh, Hong Kong actually, well, I agree that it's lagging behind. But the thing is, when, you are, uh, when we are talking about minimum wage, if you take uh, the United States or Japan as an, an example, they take certain percentage on the medium uh, earning. Uh, like in Japan, it's only about 34%. In the States, it's, about, it's less than 40% of the medium earning um, as their minimum wage. But now Hong Kong, if you are talking about $28 Hong Kong dollars uh, per hour, that is more than 50% of the medium earning. The medium earning is 56 seven Hong Kong dollars per hour. So this is the argument that we have been, you know, going on for a long what time. What trade unions are asking for $33, 33, yeah. 33 so Hong Kong not dollars. not possible. Why isn't it possible? So, well, when, if you are introducing that to $33, that is um, more than 60% of the medium earning. 
And you think that businesses will fall because of and that? And particularly when the will minimum businesses wage... Be, will businesses be affected if the course. minimum wage was of course. set? Chokian. Yeah, but again, you know, I always said that their industry, the problem is always the high rent. You know, come on, we are talking about a certain percentage, or maybe 10% on average, but in some industry, maybe 20% or uh, I agree. Our workers will get a he uh, wage increase. But then, when you look at the rent, once they <laughs> increase, it's not by 5%, 10%, it's always by 100%, 50%. So, when you compare the impact of rent, it's far more than a minimum wage. When so, the problem is always with uh, the an rent. An increase of 50%, we are talking about a period of maybe two years, three years, or, or even five years. And then on average, it's, about, it's only about um, uh, 10 to 15 percent increase per year. But then if we are talking about an increase of wage from $21 or $22 to an increase of $28, that is an increment of more than 30 percent. Yeah, but it's only one off. You know, it's just like no, the, but, the but rent. You are talking it's about, one off, fifty percent increase, one hundred percent increase. Gentlemen, can, can I? to thirty-three dollars. Gentlemen, you know? <laughs> another issue that is related to the uh, minimum wage implementation of the minimum wage is that older workers may lose their jobs because of the minimum wage. Uh, employers will say, well, if we're going to pay minimum wage and we're going to raise salaries, we will want younger, more efficient workers. What's going to happen to the older workers, Chokian? Firstly, for older workers, supposedly they should get retirement benefit. And another pro problem with Hong Kong is old workers don't have any retirement benefit. So it's, you know, the, the businesses, the government is using them as an excuse that they will be laid off. But actually, you know, they should be paid retirement benefit. And secondly, you know, are you saying that younger workers are queuing up for a minimum wage pay? You know, what we are talking about is not real, really much. No, you know, when you have $28, that, that's not true. it's only less than 6000 Hong Kong dollar per hour for eight hour job. So with less than 6000 are you saying that young workers will really embrace the 6000 you know, peanuts no, no, wages? No, when we are talking about old workers, we are not talking about people uh, aged over 60 or 65. We are talking about people who are, you know, in, in their 40s even. You know, they would be replaced by those people who are in the 30s. And but then that is absurd. That's discrimination. You are saying that 40 years old is so much different from 30 years old that the employee will just employ the 30 year old and not 40 year old. Look at me and you. You know, people <laughs> only think we are young enough, really. I'm you know, young. You are yeah, young. You are young. Yeah. So, you know, you are, yeah. you are, but I'm sure you are more than 40. So are you saying that people will replace you with a 30-ish? So, you know, come on. I think this is where age discrimination, of course, we should tackle. But I, I think we should not really uh, let the employer or the Hong Kong society as a culture discriminate against older workers because it's about you know, productivity, about efficiency. And even when you are 50 or 60, you are still very much productive. And I want to emphasize one point that we also don't want on our younger workers to embrace the minimum wage pay. If, if that is the case, it means that uh, we are not training our young workers good enough. We should train our young workers to go up the ladder and not to get the pay, minimum wage pay. The ultimate question really is, will the implementation of minimum wage help to lessen that income gap here in Hong Kong? Will it help alleviate poverty? I doubt. I really doubt. The thing is, uh, once the minimum wage is, is introduced, then um, the, the inflation is going to go up. Take uh, other countries, for example, in Europe, in the, in the States, or in any other places that have uh, minimum wages, the, the gap between the rich and the poor are widened. It never be narrow. Yeah, but firstly, it's not because of a minimum wage, but it's because well, the this whole is only finance your... sector, the investment capital, no, are really getting a very of, maybe high one, return. One of the reasons. It, you know, this but is, but I want to emphasize one, one point. Don't yeah. blame it on the minimum wage about inflation. Everyone knows that if Hong Kong had a minimum wage, it's because of a, uh, uh, inflation. It's because either of a rent, and now because the you know American is having it QE2, so you know the yarn, uh, renminbi will you know raise. And so uh, the import prices will go up. So it's nothing with the minimum wage. It's, again, of course, yeah. I can agree. Workers will be the one that suffer from, a minimum, uh, from the inflation. And the minimum wage, is it enough to overcome the inflation? It's always a question. But minimum wage is never a cause of inflation. But it is because of really other factors. 
especially the high rent and uh, imported inflation that really caused all the problems in Hong Kong. And also it would really help uh, those low-income families because what we are talking about is about, say, 300,000 families, you know, having a, a income increase of, say, $500 to $2,000 Hong Kong dollar a month, which is really substantial for them to lift them out of poverty. So, Chok Yan, apart from the minimum wage, what do you think can help alleviate poverty here in Hong Kong? Of course, you know, apart from minimum wage, we really need uh, workers' wages to go up to really share in the prosperity of uh, Hong Kong society. And so what we have been demanding is also uh, a right to collective bargaining law to, you know, uh, empower the workers through the trade union to negotiate uh, higher wages for the workers so that you know when you look at Hong Kong so prosperous but you know workers is getting really the wages had always been suppressed and when there's a you know five percent six percent economic growth the wage increase maybe zero or one or two percent so there's always a gap there and we really hope that through apart from minimum wage through collective bargaining, we can improve the livelihood of workers in Hong Kong. Simon. Well, I, I respect your ideal, but uh, it seems that it's impossible to achieve in any part of the world, even in a communist country or a capitalist country. You know, rich and the poor are always, you know, uh, they're facing back to back. But the thing is, um, as a, 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 a a businessman or as a business community here, uh, we really want to work closely with um, our partners, particularly with the workers. You know, because uh, even for an investor who invests in a restaurant or any business, they have to pump in a lot of money. They don't want to lose. And then they, ha they need the workers to help them. So the, we, we are go talking about partnership. We are not talking about fighting with each other. I hope in future we can do that. If you share the prosperity with the workers, of course, we won't fight each other. Yeah, uh, in some way, I share your view. That's the ideal world. Gentlemen, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. That's all the time we have for this edition of 101 East. You can always follow the program on YouTube, podcast, and Facebook. From all the team here in Hong Kong, thanks for watching.